This is Beer in Front, part of the Odd Pods Media Network. Every week I'll talk about a beer that maybe we've forgotten along the way while we get those check-ins and badges. Some weeks I'll talk about a new beer that has potential to be a classic. Being the Chicago beer guy, I'll also talk about great craft beer and craft beer news in the city of Chicago. Remember, sometimes the beer in front of you is the best one yet. That's Beer in Front, and it's coming up now. Welcome to the April 5th edition of Beer in Front. I'm your host, Dave Zalatoris. And Beer in Front is part of the Odd Pods Media Network. I have a good show lined up this week. If you listen to last week's show when I talked to Jay and Kay, we were discussing South O Brewing. They kindly sent over a couple beers from them. I really like their beers. So Trevor from South O agreed to join me and we discussed South O Brewing Company beers They're based in Oceanside, California, and that was a good chat, so stay tuned for that. Also this week, there are three new versions of Dead Guy Ale out there. I tried all three of them, and you'll hear my review a little bit later on in the show. I'm fighting off a little cold here, so if I don't sound my usual self, that's why I've been doing shots of NyQuil and DayQuil to go along with my beer so been a little under the weather this week so my apologies for sounding a little bit off over on youtube on my youtube channel i've been putting up pizza reviews i'm gonna attempt to try all of the pizza styles that i talked about on the pizza episode with various guests i had st louis pizza last week I also had, if you heard, he was probably, I think he was the first interview on the show. So he was in part one of the pizza episode. Brian Colburn over from my weekly mixtape and also playlist wars. He was discussing this New York style pie that had vodka sauce and penne on it. I tried it. I used a little prosciutto on there. I tried it. Put it out over on YouTube. I'm not going to lie. My stomach hurt for three days. I was cursing Brian underneath my breath. Brian, I love you, brother. That was excellent. That was just outstanding. But my stomach was killing me. But I would eat that pie again in a heartbeat. So head over to YouTube and you could look at the review of the St. Louis pie and also the New York penne and vodka sauce pizza. I'd like to thank everyone that supports the show over on Patreon. If you're interested, you could go to patreon.com slash beer in front, and you could support the show there, or just like the show, subscribe, share it with your friends. That means a lot as well, and I really do thank you for listening. I'm already making plans for the 2023 Beer in Front Awards. I'm going to have that out at the end of the year. Last year, I did the best craft beer that's over 21 and also the best macro. This year, I think I'm going to do the best craft beer over 21 because there's some new beers to add to the list. And I think that this year, I'm also going to have the best imported beer that's over 21 and those are like when i mean imports i'm talking old school imports like heineken saint Pauli girl beers that have been around forever so that's going to be included in the list like corona modello everything like that so look for that i'm going to have details in the next month or so if there's an old school beer whether it's craft or an import that you think should be included, feel free to let me know. You could email me at dave at beerinfront.com. All right, we're four minutes and 40 seconds of me rambling on on this introductory segment, so let's just stop talking and start talking beer. Hey, 
I didn't see a lot of beer news this week, but Drizzly, now they're an alcohol delivery type company. They laid off 100 people this week, and they're consolidating everything. Now, I didn't realize this, but Uber purchased Drizzly in 2021 for over a billion dollars. They also own GoPuff, so they're merging, I guess, GoPuff and Drizzly, and that resulted in about 100 layoffs. Dogfish Head is coming out with a variety pack called Crush. Now, these, on the package itself, it says there are two foolproof shots in every can. They have a vodka crush, a gin, a rum crush, different flavors. So look for that coming out this summer from Dogfish Head. And finally, from Belgium, Bar.on. This is a startup company. They're developing a molecular beer printer. This can create multiple styles of beer in seconds. Now, last week I was talking about, I believe it was a German company that is creating powdered beer that you could just make like a glass of tang. Now you'll have molecular beer coming out sometime this year. Right, well, welcome back to Beer in Front. I'm happy to have on Trevor from the South O Brewing Company. They're in Oceanside, California at 1575 South Coast Highway. Trevor, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Hey, absolutely. Thank you so much. The brewery's been open since, what, 2020? Uh, so we opened our brewery in December 2021. Okay. Some would say it's at the tail end of COVID. Some would say it's still during COVID, but it was kind of slowing down around that time. So we decided to open right in December before the holidays. Well, obviously you had the plans for it and everything going on during the pandemic. What kind of challenges was that? I'm sure that had to be like, what (laughs) were we thinking? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I feel like there was quite a few breweries at the time that were going out of business and we, we were kind of hoping that when we decided to sit down and look at this seriously to open up Briggs, we're not, both Joel uh, Steinmetz and myself, we're, we're business partners in South O. And we're actually neighbors as well, which is, uh, which made it a little bit easier to try and get a plan together pretty quickly. But, you know, we thought it was kind of one of those things where we had an opportunity, we had the time to really nail down on it and. It was more of just a bit of blind faith at the time. Okay. And, and it, it was either, it was either going to be successful or it was just going to run into the ground. And we tried to do as much as we could to mitigate the risks of opening up something like this. And there is a lot of things to mitigate. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we did, we, had, we ran into a lot of issues, you know, it, you know, it, in the start of 2021 is when we decided, okay, maybe this is a good idea. And then, uh, we spent, you know, two or three months uh, writing business plans and chatting with a lot of our friends who owned uh, breweries at the time. And so I think a bit of a combination of being neighbors, not not a lot going on at the time and having some friends that were willing to help us out and willing to sort of point us in the right direction of what are the actual realistic things of opening up a brewery were it kind of, I look at you know, hindsight's 2020, but it kind of fell into place. Okay, cool. Well, from what I've had, I've only had two of the beers. Right now, I'm having the West Coast IPA, Graves House. Everything about these beers I've enjoyed from even the texture of the can. The logo is spectacular. I mean, the can art is beautiful. Do you guys sell merch at all? Because I didn't see any on the website. No, unfortunately, uh, we, we, we haven't got that far in yet to sell okay. it on the website. Um, we will be looking to do that, uh, hopefully this year. Um, unfortunately, right now we're just selling everything through our tap room. Okay. Uh, our, our merch, every time we get merch in, it doesn't really last that long. We get it in, but definitely, uh, probably towards summer, then we'll, we'll try and get up a store, uh, on the site so we can start shipping it out because we have had quite a few requests for it. But we also wanted to, this year, get out some shirts that really represent parts of the brewery and parts of Oceanside as well. Cool. And also, you know, 
got to have stuff in stock for the tap room customers and brewery customers. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All of the beer that I've seen that are in cans are mm-hmm. gluten reduced. Is this yes. something that was a conscious effort that you guys had when coming up with the business plan? Uh, I think it fell under the category of, well, what what is the theme of our brewery? Who do we want to come to our brewery? Who's our target audience? And we sat around for probably 30 minutes and we decided, you know, we want everyone to drink our beer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we didn't want to target anybody. In particular, we were like, our beer is for everybody. And um, our head brewer, Maury Fletcher, he, he's been in the industry for quite a while. He's won numerous awards. But he, he was one of the ones who said, hey, I think we should, there's an there's a enzyme that you can use that can break down a lot of gluten uh, in beers. And the previous brewery that he worked at, uh, they had everything tested and it was all in a certain parts per million. And he said, look, there's a lot of breweries out there that are not doing this. There's a whole big marketplace for people who actually like to drink beer, but just, they just can't. So he goes, this, it, it, it's a little bit more of an expense, but it will come around to a lot of people. And that once they find out that they'll, they'll be coming to drink beer. And again, that kind of falls under the philosophy of everyone. We want everyone to drink out beer. So for us, that includes people who have intolerances to gluten. When coming up with like recipes or even new recipes, does that help or hinder the process knowing it's gluten reduced? No, not at all. No, it doesn't have any taste, any, any, any change to the flavor or the taste mm-hmm. at all. Uh, which is good. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, which is a good thing. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I feel, I feel like, uh, even I don't have a gluten allergy, but I, if I drink certain beers that are not, I, I tend to get a little bit stuffy in the nose and yeah. I get, I, you know, oh my gut, I feel like I've eaten a steak dinner. So generally I can have a couple of hours and be fine with that. But again, it's just part of, we don't, we don't advertise it that we're, we're gluten reduced. It's it's part of the brand that we we want people to know about, I guess. Yeah, you know, I'm sure, and word of mouth comes out, you know, gets out there too. You know, people that do have you know issues with gluten will be heading, you know, heading in to see you guys. Absolutely, yeah. Yep. Uh, a friend of mine, she's oh, she hasn't drank beer in about five or six years. She had a lot of gluten issues, and uh, I said, you know, should try our beer. Let us know. And she was very scared to, but eventually had one. Two, three, four. I think that's all in one hit, and she felt great. So, but again, uh, it's you know, it's just part of something, part of the philosophy that we, we want every a beer should be for everybody. Exactly. Yeah. Now, on the stuff that's in cans right now, I see you have a West Coast IPA, a hazy, a Czech Pilsner, and a Mexican yeah. Lager. Are there right. plans for future styles down the road? Absolutely. So. When we started South Air Brewing, like every every brewery, you don't know which is the beers that are really going to hit, which are the ones mm-hmm. that are going to be uh, the ones that are people who are continually coming back for or questing. And so um, in our first year of business, we, we essentially at one stage, we were, everything that was going through our fermenters, we were canning a bit of everything. Okay. We had reds, we had browns, we had... Uh, we, um, we had a, a beer, Australian sparkling ale, it's called Detmar when we first opened, and that was a three and a half percent beer. We had, I think, might have even had Vienna Lager as well, which is our Fire Mountain, uh, which was a, a really good hit. Um, but for the time being, we decided that it was just canning, you know, six and seven type, types of beer all at once for, for a fairly, you know, small brewery in, in, in the relative sense of space that we have. We just, we decided, okay, what are, what are the ones that we really want to can? What are our top four that people really like? And, uh, definitely our West Coast, the one you're drinking now, our Grace House. Um, that's a really popular beer for us, as well as our, uh, St. Marlow, which is our Czech pills now. I'm not sure if you got to try that one at all. No, I haven't, I haven't tried that or the hazy. So our hazy, uh, everyone loves a good hazy. So that was always a popular, a popular one that we have cans. And then, uh, you know, Mexican lagers are, are always a popular style. Ours is a little bit different where we, we hop it up a little bit more. It's a little bit more uh, IBUs, made to wake the hops, which gives off a lime zest. And uh, it's just, it's, it's a good combination of um, and a West Coast, but some people feel it. it's just a little bit more bitter. And, you know, when it's a hot day, that beer can go down really well. So, yeah, I enjoyed that one. You know, 
and I had it and I talked about it last week on the show and I'm like, it just, it kind of took me by surprise. Oh, there's a New Zealand hop and a Mexican lager, but it Absolutely. worked well. And, you know, that was a really good one. I enjoyed that one. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that, we have a bit of an interesting story about that. Yeah. So, uh, it's kind of path to succession of, of being in our top four was kind of interesting. So the way we start, we have a small pilot, uh, a system, which is only one keg, one half or 15 and a half gallons. And, uh, we decided, okay, what are we, what are we going to do with this thing? And uh, week in, week out, it's, you know, it's hot in San Diego. Make people, can you please make it a Mexican lager? Mexican lager. We kept hearing it from bars and restaurants, uh, people coming to, all right, let's do this. How about, um, we'll make a Mexican lager, but we'll do a little bit of research. Uh, so we went to a few liquor stores and bought about 20 Mexican lagers. They have Royal Mori, uh, Joel, myself, and uh, our assistant brewer, Ethan. We all sat down uh, after work and we all went through these 20, 20 Mexican lagers. We had to make notes as we went because, as you can imagine, it was uh, it was a good time, <laughs> good research yeah. and development. That's for sure. And so uh, we, we noticed a few things with some Mexican lagers. They use either an extract or use a puree. And a, just after one or two beers, it's had the, the lime flow that became a little bit overpowering. And uh, and so we got through these. And the next day, we uh, Maury, I have brewer, sat down and was like, all right, it has to be another way to do this. But you have a little bit of lime flavor, but it's not overpowering if you have more than one or two. So you end up finding this hop, Motueka, from New Zealand. And uh, it gives off that lime zest. And so we, we thought, okay, let's do, let's do, for Cinco de Mayo, let's do one keg of this beer. Let's do one keg, 120 pints. So we made it, we threw it on tap. It lasted two hours. <laughs> so I think the end up result was, okay, maybe we should do this, you know? Yeah. And so uh, we went and did bigger batches and then started canning it. That made the, made the cut for our, you know, more popular styles that we have. You're located in the West Coast IPA capital of the world. How does that affect like new things coming out? Are you conscious like you always have to have a West Coast or two on tap or do you pretty much just run free with what your brewer Maury wants to do? Uh, so I guess, I guess when it comes down to our, our menu, we, we have a couple of philosophies. One is, is that all our beers are under 7%. So that dictates, it dictates some of our. Uh, our menu and the styles that we kind of bring in and we don't, we don't make, uh, you know, I, I grew up in Australia and I, I drink in three and a half percent, four percent beers. And, and the good thing about that was you could have one, two, three beers if you really wanted to and not have a hangover, be okay. You know, uh, you still got to be a human the next day, whether you got to go to yeah. work or be a parent or, or, or whatnot. So. And we just decided, okay, maybe, and I think maybe it's a little bit on trend right now with a lot of lighter beers that are coming out, but you know, we, we only have, only have one West Coast IPA on tap and that's at Greg's house. And we, we decided that if we're going to have one West Coast at this time, we want to do it well. So we made little, little tinkers to it or, you know, throughout the last year and we've got it to kind of where it is now. Um, we have one hazy on tap, uh, uh, and then we just kicked uh, a black IPA, which we do once a year. Uh, we did it last year called Marine Layer. This year was called Cold Black Heart. You do go to a lot of breweries and they have, you know, half the menu is IPA. And San Diego is the IPA capital. They're the ones that sell really well and people really love them. For us, we our menu is, is, is a little bit more diverse. I feel um, we want to have a red on tap. We want to have a Vienna lager on tap. We have a Mexican lager. We have a, our Czech Pilsner, which we're really proud of that one. So these styles, they, they tend to most of the year round uh, on tap most of the year round. And also too, for our distribution as well, there's not a lot of reds out there. There's not a lot of Vienna lagers out there. And so when we bring these to bars and restaurants, beer buyers or, or owners are very, oh, I've got this. Oh, it's not an IPA. I put something else other than an IPA on my, uh, on my menu. Fantastic. You know, and yeah, it might not be the largest seller uh, of the menu, but it also offers an alternative to that category. But again, like IPAs here in San Diego are phenomenal. Like you've yeah. got some of the best IPAs, I believe 
some of the best IPAs in the world are in San Diego. You mentioned with Graves House tinkering with the recipe. Is that something you do often or when you put it out there, all right, that's my baby, it's out there. <laughs> are you always like thinking to yourself, ah, if I only did this or I only did that with this? Uh, there's been a couple of times where we've done that. Um, the original, original recipe when we bought out for Greg's house, which has been a staple on our menu since we started, uh, we, we've changed up maybe one hop in it and maybe we've changed the yeast a little bit or we've changed, uh, the boil temperature or, uh, the mash temperature, just little bits here and there. There's been some batches, um, like we, I, I give you a good example. Graves House is only been small, small changes. I think we've kind of hit on, on that when, where the market really likes it. One was our, uh, our red ale. We tinkered with that a lot and we tinkered throughout last year with it. So when we bought it on in February, which is called Station 2, that beer, where we bought it at, we actually raised some money for the Oceanside Firefighter Fund when we did it. There's a Station 2 firehouse down the street. We did a fundraiser for them, but we used certain malts on it. And then when we got to summer, we, uh, the hops on it, usually, uh, those, uh, world, old world hops on it or noble hops. We decided to go another route and use, um, a German hop called Mandarin of Bavaria, which gives it a, a, an orange zest to it a bit. And so for a red, and we sort of thinned it out, made it a little lighter for summer, hopped it up a little bit. It wasn't exactly a, uh, a red IPA per se, but it was a little bit hoppier for, for that summertime. And it sold really well. And then as we got into the cooler months, we dialed back that hops in it, changed the grain bill a little bit and for the cooler months. So it made it a little bit more malty and not as hoppy. And uh, it, it seems to, you know, that seems to flow through the year on that, on that beer particularly. So we, we innovation, innovating and, and moving around is always important. If you, if you do the same thing over and over, you become stale and, yeah, it doesn't, whether it's the brewery industry or it's any other industry too, if you're doing the same thing, you're making the same hot dog weekend, we will love it for a little while, but after a while they get sick of it. Yeah. I mean, that's something that always like I was curious about, like it's an art form brewing beer. It's not Absolutely. something it's, it's definitely an art form, just like writing a book or being a songwriter, being like a creative process. And I was wondering that about beers, like, like I can't imagine Mick Jagger thinking about changing the lines to satisfaction or Michael Hutchins <laughs> saying, you know, maybe if we call this song, never rip us apart. So I was just right. wondering how much like change goes into the final product. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another example now is our hazy, our Horn Street hazy. We, uh, we used particular yeast on it for, Last year, we used a, a Kovac Norwegian yeast, which is used to mint that beer warm. It came out pretty good, but people really love that beer. But one of the things we, we were started submitting it for competitions and the feedback we were getting was, oh, this beer is oxidized or this beer uh, is too sour or, or something like, what, what is this? What's, what's happening here? And so we kind of made the decision to change up the yeast to a, uh, a more well-known uh, yeast called London Fog. And, uh, on that, and just the complexity of the beer changed a lot and for the better. So mm -hmm. we trialed a small batch of it. We let people try it and they're like, oh yeah, this is way better. So even though I liked the original, this is a better upgrade. And okay. Yeah. You know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, yeah. We don't want to be putting out beers that are, uh, people get sick of or, or, mm -hmm. or there's ways, or there's always ways to improve, whether it's an intro or not. You mentioned earlier you have like the pilot system from Maury's like initial concept in his head to when it's on tap in the brewery. How long does that rough, roughly take? Is it like conversations between all of the partners? Like, okay, yeah. I think we could do this next. What's like the time frame between thought and tapping? So, so when, when we started, started the brewery Laurie had been had a lot more experience been in the industry a lot longer than say joel and myself we both come from uh different industries so it's pharmaceutical or the wine world or uh, and 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 so we Maury said look the best thing for us to do is to get everyone together on a particular day once a week we can all sit down and have a discussion for an hour about what where what's everyone doing where is everyone at so we're all on the same page as a team and ever since we did that at the very start, it's just been 
it's been a, it's been a real positive for us to get us on this on this path. And uh, back, I think it was back in January, he said, "Look, let's why don't we do something like um, we've got this pilot system. We haven't used it for a, for a little bit here for a few months. Let's let's do something where we'll brew up." Uh, uh, March has five, five Thursdays. So let's do an R and D series, uh, every say Thursday or every Tuesday or once a week where we release one keg of every beer. Now, before we start this, let's write all the beers that we, we had either always wanted to try or had an experience with in our lives that we would really like to try and replicate something, replicate that feeling or emotion or uh, or whatnot, and so this, so this month in um, in, uh, in in March we did that. So we last few months we were brewing on this pilot system, and so it was kind of like we had some weird ones on the board too. Like there were some strange milkshake sours and a few other different things. We end up settling on this month. We had our first week where we had a um, oh, what was the first one? I think it was a, a Munich Hellas that okay. was uh, one which was really good. We hadn't brewed that before at all. Uh, which we all really enjoyed. Uh, five days, I think that, w- that was gone. Then the next week, we had a, uh, a an IPA. It was a West Coast IPA, but we used that uh, ground up. Some, uh, we had some like, grapefruit juice, so right. we used this great particular grapefruit juice. We infused it in in our West Coast IPA, and then served that, and that was like gone in two days. Uh, this week, we had a, uh, a tropical stout. That uh, Ethan, which is our assistant brewer, he he's been wanting to brew a tropical stout. He said for years. He said this is just one style that I've seen. I've seen out there. I've never had one. Uh, it's they, they used to brew it back in a long time ago in the Caribbean. Uh, it's not a very popular style, especially in San Diego. How about we 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 make one keg of this? I've always wanted to. I was like, great, let's do it. Let's throw it on the list uh, this week. So. This other uh, this other beer that we've got coming out um, two weeks ago, uh, which is a blueberry lager. Uh, All right, I remember. Yeah, so I was I I when I was younger, I was up in up in Maine, sailing around Maine and Canada, and uh, I think it was a Bar Harbor, Maine, and I had this. There was this one bar that was there that had blueberry lager. There was a lineup out the door. And they would serve blueberries in it. And I've never forgotten that I've seen blueberry beer, but this particular blueberry beer was, it was like a, uh, it was a blueberry color, very light. It was nice. I don't know whether they actually used blueberry juice in it or these next, I don't, I don't know. I don't remember, but it was delicious. And for some reason, I always remembered that. So sitting with them, it was like, Hey, let's make a blueberry lager. And they, everyone looked at me funny. I'm like, no, no, we really want to try to make this. Cause I promise you, it's one of those beers that I've had in my past that yeah, maybe it was like 15 years ago that okay. really stuck with me, you know. So hopefully you That's, have some other people from Maine living in San Diego <laughs> that will be purchasing this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it's just, it's just you know, we, we have the ability to create. I know we did also last year a Japanese, our Japanese rice lager, oh. but we used, um, there's, a, there's a local uh, a Japanese uh, restaurant here, five-star restaurant called Matsu. And when they were building out their restaurant, um, they had a little uh, a deep fryer near the window of the front of their uh, their restaurant as they were building out all the construction inside, and they were making these Japanese chicken sandwiches, oh. and it was so delicious. People would line up to get these before they built their their beautiful restaurant, and so they they opened their restaurant, and a lot of people asked them, "Hey, are you going to bring this Japanese sandwich back?" And they said, "No, no, no." And then they decided, like they got enough pressure from everyone, so they decided to start another company called Nagi. And they were doing these um, pop-ups at the front of our brewery. Okay. Great, great guys. That's how they kind of got started as kind of like a, a test concept. Um, and this this chicken sandwich, the breading on it was like a, a lemon flavor around. It was absolutely delicious. So when we got to that point where we're like, let's make a Japanese rice lager and let's throw some uh, lemon drop hops in it to give it a slight lemon zest taste as well, mm-hmm. which, you know, was just, and again, another experiment. Yeah, people seem to enjoy it. But yeah, just little things like that, you know. I think uh, entice people to come back into breweries and and see what what's new this week, or see what's or got to come in because it's going to be gone. You know. Mm-hmm. Now you mentioned having a pop up restaurant. Do you serve food there, or is it just like pop ups or food truck type of things? Yeah. So the front of our brewery, we have a pre a, like a loading dock, 
um, kind of like a loading, it's more like a massive parking space. And um, every day we have different food vendors uh, pop up oh, cool. Monday through Friday. And then on the weekends, uh, you have them pop up around midday till about seven o'clock at night for the lunch dinner rush. So one of the, one of the things when we did open our brewery was we realized really quickly that food makes a big difference. <laughs> yeah, um, it does. Like I, I personally like to go have a few beers, but if there's a place with no no food and a place with food, I know I'm always going to go to the food. So um, we started getting in contact with some of the you know the hottest uh, food trucks and pop up vendors, barbecue. We have uh, chicken sandwiches. We have grilled cheese sandwiches. We have fried tamales. Um, and this trend, there's an, uh, a vendor from uh, Escondido. They're actually from New Zealand, and they make uh, uh, meat pies and sausage rolls and scotch eggs. So they come out, you know, a couple times a month, uh, and then we just get we just rotating through uh, pizza, uh, burgers, uh, you name it. We we get them here and we get them rolling through. And we've, we've been quite fortunate in the last twelve months. Some of the people that have come through have opened. Uh, they've been so successful with the pop-up that they've been able to go and open their own brick and mortar stores as well. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, it's it's been fantastic. So it's always good for us to help, you know, people get never have never done it before, but they've always wanted to try. We always try to help support them. Uh a few months ago we had Tony Hawk, uh the skateboarder. Oh. He's opening a uh a restaurant down in Escondido. I uh, Escondido, Encinitas, uh, which is just it's where Carl's bad and that it's called Chicken Hawk. So before they, they, before they've opened their restaurant, they were having, they, I think they were supposed to open in January, but before then they were uh, having issues trying to get that open with everything with construction wise. And, uh, and so they were like, let's, let's go and take the show on the road before we opened. And, uh, they were able to come to our brewery and we, we probably had about three to 400 people roll through the door. <laughs> so just to come and get these chicken sandwiches and drink beer, it was great. How is your distribution? Are you all over? the state or are you just still like san diego area is there something like do you do anything like through tavor where from somebody outside of the area could purchase your beer uh unfortunately at this time uh we're just distributing throughout san diego okay um we we, we have we've had opportunities uh with tavor and a few others but at this time we just we're just trying to focus on making sure that we have the ability to supply our current customers. And then too, you know, as being self-distributed, you have trucks and drivers and whatnot. And so for us, we, we, we want to scale our business according to the demand. We were very, get very nervous about growing our business too quickly and stretching too thin. And, and next minute <laughs> we're, 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 we're going down the gurgle. I mean, you see that in a lot of different businesses where they, they have an early success and they decide that they want to, um, distribute nationally and, uh, and then they, they get a little bit, uh, strung out and that's it. So that's one of the lessons that we have learned from, uh, people in the industry that, Hey, don't, don't, you might have success, but don't remember, don't grow too quickly because it could be, it could be consequences for yeah. growing too quickly. So, um, but you know, we, we're trying to scale up We're we're hoping to start distributing into, uh, Orange County and Los Angeles. Uh, hopefully by uh, June, I think July, uh, and then uh, potentially Arizona by the end of next year, or maybe uh, halfway through next year, possibly. And uh, but we we have there's been other ways we can distribute our beer um, online, like Tavor or um, I know there's Craft Shack and a few of the other different uh, online uh, sellers as well. There's other ways to do it as well, which. We have explored that as well. We just we're just working on that right now. <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot coming at us all at once, uh, and only being open for just over a year. So, well, I appreciate you coming on, Trevor. If you're in the Oceanside, San Diego area, which I'm going to be in like six weeks, so hopefully I get a chance to pop in. You need to go to South Oak Brewery once again. They're at 1575 South Coast Highway in Oceanside. The beers are terrific. Trevor is a good guy, so definitely check out Southo. Thank you. Hey, it's Dalton, and I'm Sam. 
Sam and I love to talk, and when we do, we talk big. Of course you're talking about the Big Ten. You said it. We were formerly Big Ten plus four, but we knew a change was needed. Yep. With the conference growing to 16 teams in just over a year, we decided to make our name something that reflects what our show is about while allowing the conference to keep growing. We are proud to announce our new name going forward is Big Talk. Catch Big Talk each week, just as before, on the ASAP Network. And later that day on Odd Pods Media, we bring you college sports with a Big Ten flavor. Big Talk. College sports with Midwest perspective. Blue Blue collar and blue blue blood. Be sure to catch Big Talk wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, the beers in front of me this week are from Rogue. They've expanded the Dead Guy line with three new Dead Guys. They have a variety pack. They call it the Coffin Club. It includes the traditional Dead Guy Ale. They also have a Pale Ale, an IPA, and a Pilsner. I'm going to give these a try. I'm not going to do the regular one. I've had that on the show before, but I'm going to have the three new ones. All of the cans, they have the same iconic logo with different colors as the background. The Pilsner is a white can. Now, they have their little star on the back. So this one is more floral and herbal. Clocks in at 5% alcohol, 34 IBUs, and let's crack open. The Dead Guy Pilsner. Very nice, light gold color. Excellent carbonation here. I probably get a good three fingers of foam here. Smells nice. Just smells like a good classic Pilsner. That's pretty good. Uh, little more sweet than your usual Pilsners. It's not, I'm trying to describe it. It's not like old school Pilsner. If you're thinking of a traditional macro, this is different here. It's, it's pretty solid. No, I drink that again. I don't know if like all of these new ones, I don't know if they're in like one offs. If you could just buy a six pack of them or not, or if you have to buy this coffin club. I happened to see this at my Binnie's, and they had each of them in the Build Your Own six-pack section, so I grabbed it that way so I could try them all. The Pilsner's not a bad beer, so if you're looking for a Pilsner and you haven't had a Rogue Dead Guy in a while, I would recommend that you try out Rogue Dead Guy Pilsner. Next up is the Pale Ale. This is in the purple can. They feature El Dorado and Sabro hops. According to them, it creates a burst of tangerine and peach notes. So let's crack this one open. Now, the pale ale is 5.5% alcohol and 35 IBUs. This one's really good. Good color to it. Like the Pilsner, it has a lot of foam. I'd say good three fingers here. But no, it's a good color. It's a pale, uh, very little murkiness here. Looks good. Really nice aroma. I like the aroma on the pale here. No, that's really good. Now, I get, I think I get more of a, like the citrus, the tangerine, than I do the tropical here. But I think it's a really good, solid pale ale. No, that's good. I would drink this again. Like, if they sold this in a six-pack by itself, I would pick this up. I think this is a pretty good beer. So, if you see Solo in the purple can, the Dead Guy Pale Ale, I definitely recommend putting this one in the cart. And finally, the last of the Dead Guys that I'm going to have. That didn't sound right, but the last of the new Dead Guy beers I'm going to have is the Dead Guy IPA. This clocks in at 7% alcohol, has very nice 69 IBUs. This has citra hops and mosaic, and let's crack this one open.
the IPA looks like your traditional West Coast IPA. Looks very nice, good dark color to it. Good carbonation and foam here. The smell is good. I get I get a little pine to this. I get more citrus than tropical, but it has a very, very solid aroma. Really good flavor. I like this a lot. I'm trying to figure out which is hitting me here. I get a little of everything, to be honest with you. I get some pine in this. I get the tropical. I get the citrus. It's very good. The Pac-Man yeast that Rogue uses in pretty much everything they use in the IPA as well. I'm not sure if they use the same Pac-Man yeast in the other two, but they definitely use it in this one. It has a very crisp finish to it. Clocks in at 69. Nice IBUs, but it's not a super bitter beer like you would expect for something that high. I think this is good. So if you see that variety pack of different dead guys, I would definitely throw that one in the cart. All right, that's going to wrap things up for this week's episode of Beer in Front. I thank you very much for listening. I also want to thank once again Trevor over at South O Brewing. If you're in the Oceanside, California area, be sure to hit them up. I will talk to you next week on the podcast. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, sometimes the beer in front of you is the best one yet.